Chapter 12 of The Flying Girl. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Danielle Hetzel. The Flying Girl by L. Frank Baum. Chapter 12 The Spying of Tot Tyler. Mr. Burthon was like many other men accustomed to modern business methods. He believed there was always an indirect way to accomplish whatever he desired. Also, like many others who have little or no use for such a contrivance, he owned a motor-car. His chauffeur was a little, wizen-featured man named Totham Tyler, familiarly called Tot by his chums, a chauffeur who knew automobiles backward and forward and might have progressed beyond his present station had he not been recognized as so tricky that no one had any confidence in him. About two weeks after Orissa had left the office, Mr. Burthon said to his man one morning, "'Tyler, would you like to do a little detective work?' "'Anything to oblige, sir,' answered Totham, pricking up his ears. "'Have you ever met a fellow around town named Kane?' "'Stephen Kane, sir? Oh, yes. He used to be foreman of Cunningham's Repair Shop.' quit there some time ago, I believe. Clever fellow, sir, this cane. Yes, he has invented a new sort of aeroplane. Tyler whistled reflectively. All motor-car people have a penchant for flying. As Mr. Cumberford would have said, it interests them. Kane is keeping the matter a secret, continued Mr. Burthon, and I'm curious to know what he's up to. Find out, Tyler, and let me know. Very good, sir. Where is he working? At home. He lives out Beverly Way. Take a Beverly car and get off at Sandringham Avenue. Walk north up the lane to the first bungalow. Ever been there, sir? No, but Kane's sister has described the place to me. When you get there, try to hire out as an assistant. But in any case, keep your eyes open and observe everything in sight. I'll pay you extra for this work according to the value of the information you obtain. I understand, sir, answered Tyler wrinkling his leathery face into a shrewd smile. I know how to work a game of that sort, believe me. In pursuance of this mission, the little chauffeur came to the Kane residence that very afternoon. As he approached the bungalow, he heard the sound of pounding upon metal coming from the canvas-covered hangar. Otherwise, the country lay peacefully sunning itself. An automobile stood in the lane. On the front porch, a woman sat knitting, but raised her head at the sound of footsteps. Tyler touched his cap, but there was no response. Looking at her closely, he saw the woman was blind, so he passed her stealthily and tiptoed up the narrow path toward the hangar. The top canvas had been drawn back on wires to admit the air, but the entrance was closed by curtains. Tyler listened to the hammering a moment, and summoning his native audacity to his aid, boldly parted the curtains and entered. "'Hello, Kane," he called then paused and took in the scene before him at a glance. Stephen was at the bench pounding into shape an aluminum propeller blade. A tall man with a drooping mustache stood near, watching him. A young girl was busily sewing strips of canvas. On its rack lay a huge flying machine, its planes spread, the motors in place, the running gear complete, seemingly almost ready for action. But Tyler was not the only one with eyes. Kane paused with uplifted hammer and regarded the intruder with a frown of annoyance. Orissa stared in startled surprise. The tall man's spectacles glittered maliciously. Berthin's chauffeur, he muttered. I remember him. Swiftly, his long arm shot out, seized Tyler's shoulder, and whirled him around. The square toe of a heavy shoe caught the little man unprepared and sent him flying through the entrance, where he sprawled full length upon the ground. In an instant he was up, snarling with rage. The curtains were closed, and before them stood his assailant calmly lighting a cigarette. "'Mr. Cumberford, sir,' gasped Tyler, "'you shall smart for this. It's actionable, sir. It's—it's it's assault and battery, that's what it is.' "'Want any more?' asked the man coolly. "'Not today, thank you. This'll cost you plenty.' "'Then go back to Burthen and tell him we know his game. You're trespassing, sir.' I could wring your neck, perhaps I will, and the law would uphold me. If you want to escape alive, make tracks. Totham Tyler took the hint. He walked away with as much dignity as he could muster, considering his anatomy had so recently been jarred. 
but he did not take the car home. Oh, no. There was much more to discover inside that hangar. He would wait until night and then take his time to explore the place fully. With this end in view, the chauffeur secreted himself in the outskirts of the orange grove, creeping underneath a tree with thick branches that nearly touched the ground. He could pick ripe fruit from where he lay and was well content to rest himself until night came. An hour later, Mr. Cumberford whirled by in his motor car, headed for the city. Tyler shook his fist at his enemy and swore effectively to relieve his feelings. Then he sank into a doze. The approaching chug of an engine aroused him. He found it was nearly dark, so he must have slept for some hours. Here was Cumberford, back with his car and speeding up the lane so swiftly that Tot could only see a cage-like affair occupying the rear section of the automobile. The chauffeur wondered what this could be, puzzling his brain for a solution of the problem. Even while considering the matter, Cumberford passed him again, smoking his eternal cigarette and running the car more deliberately now toward the city. All right, mumbled the chauffeur. He's out of the way for the night anyhow. But he left the cage somewhere. What the blazes could he have had in it? He ate a few more oranges for his supper, smoked his pipe, snoozed again, and awoke to find it was nearly midnight. Good, said he. Now's my time. I don't mind a bit of a wait if I get the goods in the end, and here's where I get them. Takes a pretty good man to outwit Tot Tyler. They'll agree to that by and by. He crept down the lane and kept on the south side of the hedge until he came opposite the hangar, thus avoiding the house and grounds. The canvas top of the shed showed white in the moonlight not twenty feet from where he stood, and the chauffeur was pressing aside the thick hedge to find an opening when a deep bay, followed by a growl, smote his ears. He paused, his head thrust half through the foliage, his blood chilled with terror as there bounded from the hangar a huge bloodhound, its eyes glaring red in the dim light, its teeth bared menacingly. Tot thought that he was done for, as he afterward told Mr. Burthon, when, with a jerk, the great beast stopped a yard from the hedge, and the clank of a chain showed it could come no farther. Tyler caught his breath, broke from the hedge, and sprinted down the lane at his best gate, followed by a succession of angry bays from the hound. "'Confound Cumberford!' he muttered. "'The brute was in that cage, and he went to town to get it, so as to keep me out of the hangar. That's two I owe this guy, and I'll get even with him in time, sure's fate.' There was no car at this hour, so the discomfited chauffeur had to trudge seven miles to the city, where he arrived at early dawn. The man was not in an amiable frame of mind when he brought Mr. Burthon's automobile to the club, where his master lived, at nine o'clock. As he drove the broker to the office, he related his news. "'Cumberford!' cried Mr. Burthon. "'Are you sure it was Cumberford?' "'Yes, sir, I remember him well. Took him to your office and the bank, you know, the time you had some deal with him, and he tried to tell me how to run the car. Me! I spotted him right away for a fresh guy from the east, and now he's kicked me out of Kane's hangar and set a dog on me.' Oh, yes, I know Cumberford. So do I, said Burthon grimly. Tyler caught the tone. I'll do him yet, sir. Leave it to me. I couldn't get much of a pointer on Kane's aeroplane. Hadn't time, you know. But it looked like a rosebud, and I guess he's got something good. I'm going to find out. I'll take out a dose for the dog that'll put him to sleep in a wink, and then I'll go all over the thing careful. Never mind the airship, said Mr. Burthon. I found out what I wanted to know. What? "'You have, sir?' exclaimed the chauffeur, amazed. "'Yes,' was the quiet reply. "'That is, if you're positive the man at the Canes was Cumberford. "'Sure? Why, I'd stake my life on it, sir.' "'Then I'll follow the clue in my own way,' said Mr. Burthon, alighting from the car. The discovery made by Tyler necessitated a change in the proposed campaign. The broker entered his office, sat down at his desk, and fell into one of his fits of deep abstraction. The new secretary, noting this, chewed her gum reflectively a moment and then began to read a novel, keeping the volume concealed behind her desk. If Cumberford was in the hangar, Mr. Burthon mused, he has undertaken to back Kane's aeroplane, and I'm too late to get hold of the machine in the way I'd planned. I suppose the fool offered better terms than I did to blind those simple children, and so the Canes turned me down. Never mind. Cumberford has beaten me on two deals, but the third trick shall be mine. I must get hold of the designs of Kane's aeroplane in some way. Perhaps I may find them at the patent office. 
then I'll regulate things so the boy's invention will prove a failure. The result ought to satisfy me. It would cause Cumberford serious loss, ruin young Kane, and bring Arissa to me for assistance. But Tyler can't manage the job. I must have a man more clever than he is and direct the intrigue in person. The secretary read and chewed most of the day. When she quit work at five o'clock, Mr. Burthon was still thinking. End of chapter 12「Steve was now progressing finely with the work on the Kane aircraft and believed he would be able to overcome all the imperfections that had disclosed themselves during the first trial. Mr. Cumberford came to the hangar nearly every day now, and Steve and Arissa began to wonder how he found time to attend to other business, provided he had any. On the day of Tyler's visit, he had announced it was his last trip to see the Canes, as he had been summoned to Chicago to attend a director's meeting and from there would go to New York. But having discovered that Bertham was intent upon some secret intrigue, which could bode no good to his protégés, the Canes, he promptly changed his mind and informed Steve on a subsequent visit that he had arranged affairs at home and was now free to spend the entire winter in Southern California. My daughter likes it here, he added, and kicks up fewer rows than she does at home, so there's a strong point in favor of this location. Aviation interests me. I've joined the Aero Club out here and subscribed for the big meet to be held in January at Dominguez Field. That's when we are to show the world the cane invention, my lad, and I think it will be an eye-opener to most of the crowd present. How does your mind, the Queen of Hearts, get along? asked Arissa. It continues to pay big, even better than I had hoped. Bertha must be pretty sore over that deal by this time. Speaking of my sainted brother-in-law, I just made a discovery. He owns the mortgage on your place. Why, we got the money from the security bank, exclaimed Orissa. I know, I went there. Thought I'd take up the mortgage myself, but found Bertham had bought it. Now the question is, why? Neither brother nor sister could imagine it, but Cumberford knew. He hopes you won't be able to meet it, and then he'll foreclose and turn you out, he said. But you're not the principal game he's after. He's shooting me over your heads. Bertham is miffed because I let you have the money but believes I haven't any financial or personal interest in you beyond that. If he can prevent your aircraft from flying, he'll make me lose my money, and also ruin you two youngsters. That's doubtless his game, and that's why he sent his man here to spy upon you. But that is absurd. Burthon can't prevent our success, declared Steve. Even if some minor parts go wrong, the aircraft will fly strongly and as well as anything now in existence. Don't be too sure, cautioned Mr. Cumberford. You and your machine may be all right, but that's no reason why Bertham can't push failure at you or even prevent you from flying. We must watch him. I do not believe the man hates us, observed Arissa thoughtfully. Mr. Bertham is a little queer and unscrupulous at times, but I don't consider him a bad man by any means. I know him better than you do, and he hates me desperately, replied Cumberford. He says that that you abused his sister, doubtfully remarked the girl. Well, I did, said Cumberford calmly. I pounded her two or three times. Once I choked her until it's a wonder she even revived. Oh, how dreadful, exclaimed Arissa, shrieking back. Isn't it, he agreed, lighting a cigarette. Only a brute would lift a hand against a woman. But Bertham's sister, my wife, had a fiendish temper, and her tantrums aroused all the evil in my nature. There's plenty there, I assure you. It was the time I choked her that Bertham had me arrested for cruelty. She had put poison in my coffee, and I took the fluid into court with me. Bertham said I was lying, and I asked him to drink the coffee to establish his sister's innocence. But he wouldn't try. Pity, wasn't it? The judge begged my pardon and said I ought to have choked her a moment longer. But no, I'm glad I didn't, for she died naturally in the end. My dear daughter, whom I sincerely love, is like her lamented mother, except 
that I trust her not to poison me. Does she love you in return? asked Arissa. Sybil? Why, she's tremendously fond of me, my daughter. And his voice grew suddenly tender. Has been for years. Is now the only person I live for. We're chums, we two. Poor child can't help her inherited tendencies, you know. And I rather enjoy the fact that she keeps me guessing what she's going to do next. It, uh, interests me, so to speak. I like Sybil. Sybil interested Arissa, too. Her father's reports of her was so startlingly condemnatory, and his affection for her so evident, that Arissa's curiosity was aroused concerning her. Mr. Cumberford, in spite of his peculiarities and deprecating remarks concerning himself, had won the friendship of both Stephen and Arissa by this time. For whatever he might be to others, he had certainly proved himself a friend in need to them. It was evident he liked the Canes and sought their companionship, for the aircraft could scarcely account for his constant attendance at the hangar. "'I would like to meet your daughter,' said the girl thoughtfully. "'Would you really?' he asked eagerly. "'Well, I'm sure it wouldn't hurt Sybil to know you. I'll bring her out here tomorrow, if she'll come. Never can tell what she will do or won't do, you know. Interesting, isn't it?' Quite so, she concurred, laughing at his whimsical tone. Because of this conversation, the Canes awaited Mr. Cumberford's arrival next day with keen curiosity. Steve advanced the opinion that the girl wouldn't come, but Arissa thought she would, and she did. When the motor car stopped in front of the bungalow, there was a girl in the back seat, and Arissa ran down the path to meet her. A pale, composed face looked out from beneath a big black hat with immense black plumes. A black lace waist with black silk bolero and skirt furnished a somber costume scarcely suited to so young a girl. For Sybil, Cumberland could not have been much older than Arissa, if any. Her father was right when he claimed that Sybil was not beautiful. She had high, prominent cheekbones, a square chin, and a nose with a decided uplift to the point. But her brown hair was profuse and exquisitely silky. Her dark eyes large, well-opened, and far-seeing, her slight form carried with unconscious grace. Arissa's critical glance took in these points at once, and intuitively she decided that Sybil Cumberford was not unattractive and not to win friends. That she had a strong personality was evident. Also, the girl, who, who her father had affectionately called a demon, was quiet, reserved, and undemonstrative, at least during their first interview. She acknowledged the introduction to Arissa with a rather haughty bow, alighting from the car without noticing Miss Kane's outstretched hand. "'Which way to the airplane, Daddy?' she asked, speaking not flippantly but in low, quiet tones. "'I'll lead the way. You girls may follow,' he said. As they went up the path, Arissa, anxious to be sociable and to put the stranger at ease, said brightly, "'Don't you think the ride out here is beautiful?' "'Yes,' responded Sybil." The orange groves are so attractive just now, continued Arissa. There was no response. I hope you enjoyed it, so you will be tempted to come again, resumed the little hostess. Miss Cumberford said nothing. Her father, a step in advance, remarked over his shoulder, My daughter seldom wastes words. If you wish her to speak, you must address to her a direct question. Then she will answer it or not as she pleases. It's her way, and you have to overlook it. Arissa flushed and glanced sideways to get a peep at Sybil's face, that she might note how the girl received this personal criticism. But the features were as unemotional as wax, and the dark, mysterious eyes were directed toward the hangar, the roof of which now showed plainly. It was hard to continue a conversation under such adverse conditions, and Arissa did not try. In silence, they traversed the short distance to the shed, where Steve met them, a little abashed at receiving a young lady in his workshop. But Mr. Cumberford's daughter never turned her eyes upon him. She gave a graceful little nod when presented to the inventor, but ignored him to stare at the aircraft, which riveted her attention at once. This, Sybil, said her father enthusiastically, is the famous airplane to be known in history as the Kane Aircraft. It's as far ahead of the ordinary biplane as a sewing machine is ahead of a needle and thimble. It will do things, you know, so it, uh, interests me. It seemed to interest her also, examining the details of construction. With considerable minuteness, she began asking questions that rather puzzled Mr. Cumberford. 
who retreated in favor of Steve. The inventor explained, and as all his heart and soul were in the aeroplane, he explained so simply and comprehensively that Sybil's dark eyes suddenly flashed upon his face and clung there until the young fellow paused, hesitated, and broke down embarrassed. Arissa smiled at Steve's shyness, picked up the subject, and dilated upon it at length, for the girl had every detail at her tongue's end and understood the mechanism fully as well as her brother did. The visitor listened to her with interest, and when she had no more questions to ask, stood in absorbed meditation before the aeroplane, as if in a dream, and wholly disregarded the others present. This is the end of chapter 13. Chapter 14 of The Flying Girl. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christy Lufer. The Flying Girl by L. Frank Baum. Chapter 14 The Flying Fever. Mr. Cumberford said frankly to Steve and Orissa, don't expect too much of Sybil, or you'll be disappointed. She's peculiar, and the things that interest her are often those the world cares nothing for. Anything odd or unusual is sure to strike her fancy. That's why she's so enraptured with the aircraft. The word enraptured did not seem to Steve to describe Sybil's attitude at all, but Orissa, watching the girl's face, decided it was especially appropriate. They left her standing before the machine and went on with their work, while Mr. Cumberford ignored his daughter and smoked cigarettes, while he watched, as usual, every movement of the young mechanic. "'Saw Berthen this morning,' he remarked presently. "'Did he say anything?' asked Steve. "'No, just smiled. That shows he's up to something. Wonder what it is.' Steve shook his head. "'I don't see how that man can possibly injure me,' he said musingly. "'I've gone straight ahead in an honest fashion and minded my own business. "'As for the machine, that's honest, too, and all my improvements are patented.' "'They're what?' "'Patented, sir. Registered in the patent office at Washington.' "'Oh, ho!' Steve looked at him, surprised. "'Well, sir?' "'You're an irresponsible idiot, Stephen Kane.' "'Because I patented my inventions?' "'Yes, sir. "'For placing full descriptions and drawings of them before the public "'until you've startled the aviation world "'and are ready to advertise what you've done.' "'Steve stared at him, "'a perception of Cumberford's meaning gradually coming to him. "'Why, as for that—' he said a little uneasily. No one ever takes the trouble to read up new patents. There are so many of them, and, after all, it's a protection. Is it? I can put another brace on that new elevator of yours and get a patent on it as an improvement. The brace won't help it any, but it will give me the right to use it. I'm not positive I couldn't prevent you from using yours, if I got mine publicly exhibited and on the market first. Steve was bewildered, and Orissa looked very grave, but Mr. Cumberford lighted another cigarette and added, "'Nevertheless, I wouldn't worry. As you say, the patent office is a rubbish heap which few people ever care to examine. Is everything covered by patent?' "'Everything but the new automatic balance. I haven't had time to send that on.' "'Then don't. The old one is patented.' but it proved a failure and nearly killed me. The one I'm now completing is entirely different. Good. Don't patent it until after the aviation meet. It's your strongest point. Keep that one surprise, at least, up your sleeve. As Steve was considering this advice, Sybil Cumberford came softly to her father's side and said, Daddy, I want to fly. To flee or to flew, he asked banteringly, at the same time looking at her intently. To fly in the air. Mr. Cumberford sighed. Kane, what will a duplicate of your aircraft cost? 
"'I can't say exactly, sir,' replied the boy, smiling. "'Shall we order one, Sybil?' She stood staring straight ahead, with that impenetrable, mysterious look in her dark eyes which was so typical of the girl. Cumberford threw away his cigarette and coughed. <clears throat> "'We'll consider that proposition some time, Steve,' he continued rather hastily. "'Meantime, perhaps my daughter could make a trial flight in your machine.' "'Perhaps,' said Steve doubtfully. "'Will it carry two? "'It would support the weight of two easily,' replied the young man. "'But I would be obliged to rig up a second seat.' "'Do so, please,' requested Miss Cumberford, in her even, subdued voice. When will it be ready? The aircraft will be complete in about ten days from now, but before I attempt to carry a passenger I must give it a thorough personal test, said Steve, with decision. You may watch my flights, Miss Cumberford, if you wish, and after I've proved the thing to be correct and safe I'll do what I can to favor you, if you're not afraid and still want to make the trial. Thank you, she said, and turned away. I'll go myself some time observed Mr. Cumberford after a pause. Flying interests me. Orissa was much amused. She had not known many girls of her own age, but such as she had were all commonplace creatures compared with this strange girl, who at present seemed unable to tear herself away from the airship. Sybil did not convey the impression of being ill-bred or forward, however unconventional she might be, Yet it seemed to Orissa that she constantly held herself firmly repressed, yet alert and watchful, much like a tiger crouched ready to spring upon an unsuspecting prey. In spite of this uncanny attribute, Orissa found herself powerfully drawn toward the peculiar girl, and resolved to make an attempt to win her confidence and friendship. With this thought in mind, she joined Sybil, who was again examining the aeroplane with rapt attention. While she stood at her side, the girl asked, without glancing up, "'Have you ever made a flight?' "'No,' replied Orissa. "'Why not?' "'I haven't had an opportunity.' "'Don't you like it?' "'I imagine I would enjoy a trip through the air,' answered Orissa. "'That is, after I became accustomed to being suspended in such a thin element.' "'You seem to understand your brother's invention perfectly.' "'Oh, I do, in its construction and use. "'You see, I've been with Steve from the beginning. "'Also, I've examined several other modern aeroplanes "'and watched the flights at Dominguez Field. "'Naturally, I'm enthusiastic over aviation, "'but I haven't yet considered the idea of personally attempting a flight. "'To manage a machine in the air requires a quick eye, "'a clear brain, and a lot of confidence and courage.' "'Is it so dangerous?' asked Miss Cumberford quietly. Not if you have the qualities I mention, and a bit of experience or training to help you in emergencies. I'm sure an aeroplane is as safe as a steam car, and a little safer than an automobile, but a certain amount of skill is required to manage even those. The girl's lips curled scornfully, as if she impugned this statement. But she remained silent for a while before continuing her catechism. Do you mean to try flying? "'Perhaps so, some day,' said Orissa, smiling. "'When aeroplanes have become so common that my fears are dissipated. "'But really I haven't given the matter a thought. "'That is Steve's business just now. "'All I'm trying to do is help him get ready.' "'You believe his device to be practical?' "'It's the best I've ever seen, and I've examined all the famous aeroplanes.' "'What has my father to do with this invention?' Orissa was surprised. "'Hasn't he told you?' she asked. "'Only that it interests him, but many things do that. "'We needed money to complete the aircraft, and Mr. Cumberford kindly let us have it,' explained the girl. "'What did he demand in return?' "'Nothing but our promise to repay him in case we succeed.' Sybil shot a swift glance toward her father. "'Look out for him,' she murmured. He's a dangerous man in business deals. But this isn't business, protested Orissa earnestly. Indeed, his act was wholly irregular from a business standpoint. As a matter of fact, 
mr cumberford has been very generous and unselfish in his attitude toward us we like your father miss cumberford and we trust him the girl stood silent a moment then she slowly turned her face to Arissa, with a rare and lovely smile which quite redeemed its plainness from that moment she lost her reserve toward Arissa at least and it was evident the praise of her father had fully won her heart. Day by day thereafter, Sybil came with Mr. Cumberford to the hangar, until the important time arrived when Steve was to test the reconstructed aircraft. By Cumberford's advice, the trial was made in the early morning, and in order to be present, both father and daughter accepted the hospitality of the Canes for the previous night. Sybil, sharing Orissa's bed, while Steve gave up his room to Mr. Cumberford and stretched himself upon a bench in the hangar. Mrs. Kane knew that her son was to make an attempt to fly at daybreak, but was quite undisturbed. The description of the Kane aircraft, which Orissa had minutely given her, seemed to inspire her with full confidence, and if she had a thought of danger she never mentioned it to anyone. The Cumberfords were very nice to Mrs. Kane, while she, in return, accepted their friendship unreservedly. Orissa knew her mother to be an excellent judge of character, for while her affliction prevented her from reading a face, her ear was trained to catch every inflection of a voice, and by that she judged with rare accuracy. Once she said to her daughter, "'Mr. Cumberford is a man with a fine nature who has in some way become embittered, perhaps through unpleasant experiences.' He does not know his real self, and mistrusts it, for which reason his actions may at time be eccentric or even erratic, but under good influences he will be found reliable and a safe friend. His daughter, on the contrary, knows her own character perfectly and abhors it. As circumstances direct, she will become very bad or very good for she has a strong, imperious nature, and may only be influenced through her affections. I think it is good for her to have you for a friend. This verdict coincided well with Orissa's own observations, and she accepted it as veritable. Yet Sybil was a constant enigma to her, and seldom could she understand the impulses that dominated her. The girl was mysterious in many ways. She saw everything and everyone without looking directly at them. She found hidden meanings in the most simple and innocent phrases. Always she seemed suspecting an underlying motive in each careless action, and Orissa was often uneasy at Sybil's implied suggestion that she was not sincere. The girl would be cold and silent for days together, then suddenly become animated and voluble, a mood that suited her much better than the first. Steve said to his sister, "'You may always expect the unexpected of Sybil,' which proved he had also been studying this peculiar girl. End of chapter Chapter 15 of The Flying Girl This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christy Lufer. The Flying Girl by L. Frank Baum. Chapter 15 A Final Test. It was the morning of the 10th of December that the eager little group assembled at dawn on Marston's pasture to witness the test of the Kane aircraft. Steve was so occupied with his final adjustments and anxiety, lest he should overlook some important point, that he never thought of danger. He would not have remembered even his goggles had not Orissa handed them to him and told him to put them on. This was the first time Mr. Cumberford had witnessed a performance of the aeroplane, yet he was much less excited than his daughter, who could not withdraw her gaze from the device, and was nervously attentive to every move that the young aviator made. Orissa, confident of the result, was the most composed of all. When all was ready, Steve took his seat, started the motors, and when they had acquired full speed, threw in the clutch. The aeroplane ran less than fifty feet on its wheels before it began to rise. 
when it steadily soared into the air and mounted to an elevation of several hundred feet. By this time the aviator, who had kept a straight course, was half a dozen miles from the starting point, but now he made a wide circle and, returning, passed over Marston's pasture at the same high altitude. The speed of the aircraft was marvellous. Mr. Cumberford declared it was making a mile a minute, which estimate was probably correct. After circling for a while, Steve descended to a hundred feet in a straight dive, holding the device in perfect control and maintaining at all times an exact balance. At a hundred feet he tested the rudders thoroughly, proving he could alter his course at will, make sharp turns and circle in a remarkably small space. Then, having been in the air twenty-seven minutes by the watch, he descended to the ground, rolled a hundred feet on his running gear, and came to a halt a few paces away from the silent, fascinated group of watchers. Not a hitch had occurred. The Kane aircraft was as perfect a creation as its inventor had planned it to be. Orissa gave Steve a kiss when he alighted, but said not a word. Sybil impulsively seized the aviator's hands and pressed them until he flushed red. Mr. Cumberford lighted a fresh cigarette, nodded approvingly, and said, "'All right, Steve. It interests me.' "'It almost seemed alive,' remarked Steve, with pardonable exuberance. "'Why, I believe it would fly bottom-side up if I asked it to.' "'Any changes necessary?' inquired Mr. Cumberford. "'Only one or two, and those unimportant. The steering wheel is a bit loose and needs tightening. The left guy wires are a bit too taut and need to be relieved. Half an hour's tinkering and the aircraft will be as perfect as I know how to make it.' As they were wheeling it back in the hangar, Sybil asked, "'Weren't you frightened, Mr. Kane, when you were so high above the earth?' "'Oh, no. It's far safer a mile up than it is fifty or a hundred feet. There are no dangerous air currents to contend with, and the machine glides more smoothly the more air it has underneath it. When I'm near the earth I sometimes get a little nervous, but never when I'm far up. But suppose you should fall from that distance? Fall? Oh, but you can't fall very easily with this sort of biplane. At any angle it's a kind of parachute, you know, for the hinged ends automatically spread themselves against the air pressure. And as for a tumble, you know that a fall of fifty feet would kill one as surely as a fall of several hundred feet. If a fellow can manage to stick to his aeroplane, he's pretty safe. It seems such a frail thing, observed Sybil musingly. Just wooden ribs and canvas, laughed Steve. But anything stronger would be unnecessary, and therefore foolish. Now then, said Mr. Cumberford, when the aircraft rested once more upon its rack, I have something to tell you, Kane. I have known it for several days, but refrained from speaking until you had made your trial. There was an ominous suggestion in the words. Steve turned and looked at him questioningly. Any bad news, sir? Time will determine if it's bad or good. Anyhow, it's news. Burthon is building an aircraft. An aeroplane? I said, an aircraft. But that word designates only my own machine. Burthon is building your machine. Steve stared at him, doubtful if he had heard aright. Orissa stood motionless, growing white and red by turns. Sybil's lips curled in a sneer as she said, My clever uncle, what a resourceful man he is. I, I don't believe I understand, stammered Steve. It's simple enough, replied Cumberford. Burthon sent to Washington for copies of your plans and specifications, has built a hangar and workshop over South Pasadena Way, and employed a clever mechanic from Cleveland to superintend the construction, already well under way. How do you know this, sir? inquired Steve, breathless. The clever mechanic from Cleveland is my own man, who has been my confidential agent for years. And you permit him to do this work? cried the young man indignantly. To be sure. If Brewster loses the job, someone will get it who is not my agent. It is the only way I can keep accurate account of what Burthon is up to. 
They were all silent for a time while they considered this startling information. By and by Cumberford said, "'Burthon has joined the Aero Club and donated a handsome cup for the best endurance flight during the coming meet at Dominguez, and in some way has made himself so popular with the officials that he has been appointed a member of the Committee on Arrangements. I dropped in at the club yesterday, for I'm a member, and made this discovery. My scheming brother-in-law has some dusky, deep-laid plan, and is carrying it out with particular attention to detail.' "'Do you think it concerns us, sir?' asked Orissa anxiously. "'Yes.' "'Isn't it extraordinary that Burthon should take a fancy to aviation? He is full of fads and fancies, and such a thing is liable to interest him. It interests me. But the meat in the nut is the fact that he is building a copy of the Kane aircraft, merely adding a few details, which he will declare are improvements.' "'Can't we—' "'Issue an injunction and stop him?' asked Steve. "'I've seen a lawyer about that. We can't prove infringement at this stage of the game, and it would be folly to attempt it. Burthon's plan is to exhibit his machine first, then keep yours off the field during the meet, and afterward claim that you are infringing upon his rights. He has organized a stock company, keeping most of the stock himself, has entered the device in all the aviation tournaments throughout the country, and is issuing a circular offering the machines for sale. I have a hand proof, fresh from the printer of this circular. "'Who will be his aviator?' asked Steve, with puckered brows. "'His former chauffeur, Mr. Totham Tyler, is one. He is now looking for another also.' Steve drew a long breath. "'What can we do?' he asked in a bewildered tone. "'Checkmate him,' was the composed reply. "'How, sir?' "'Well, we know pretty well all Burthon's plans. He doesn't suspect we know a thing. Believes he will be able to keep his secret until his aeroplane is ready, and he can announce it in the newspapers and create a sensation. He has concocted a very pretty trick. Until this date—' No one has ever heard of the Kane aircraft. After the Burthon improved biplane is exploited and its praise on every tongue, you won't be able to get even a hearing with your invention, much less a chance to fly it. Steve sat down and covered his face with his hands. His attitude was one of despair. When will Mr. Burthon's machine be finished? asked Orissa thoughtfully. He expects to make the first trial a week from tomorrow. He has kept a force of expert men at work, and they haven't attempted to make the Kane engines, but are using a type that has worked successfully in many biplanes. So his machine will grow into existence very quickly. A week from tomorrow, repeated Orissa softly, and Steve is ready today. Steve looked up quickly. Sybil laughed at him. You silly boy! said she. Can't you understand what Daddy means by a checkmate? Steve turned to Mr. Cumberford, who was lighting a fresh cigarette. If you will place the matter in my hands, said that gentleman, I will proceed to put a spoke in Burthon's wheel, so to speak. Heretofore, Steve, I have been a mere onlooker, a an interested friend, I may say. At this juncture you'd better make me your manager." "'Would you accept the position?' asked the boy. "'Yes. There isn't much else to interest me just now, and I hate Burthon.' "'Poor uncle,' sighed Sybil. "'On what terms will you undertake this, sir?' Steve inquired with anxiety. "'Why, I may have to spend a lot of money. Probably will. And my time's valuable.' When I'm not here, I'm moping at the Alexandria Hotel. So I propose you give me ten percent of your profits for the first three years. That is absurd, sir, declared Steve. There will be little profit at first, and ten percent wouldn't amount to anything. Mr. Cumberford smiled, a grim smile that was one of his peculiarities. It'll do, Steve. 
I'll make it pay me well, see if I don't. But you may add to the demand, if you like, by promising to present my daughter the fourth complete cane aircraft your factory turns out. The first, cried Steve. No, the fourth. We want the first three to go where they'll advertise us. Is it a bargain, Mr. Kane? Steve grasped his hand. Of course, sir, he replied gratefully. I'm not sure we can defeat Mr. Burthon's conspiracy, but I know you will do all that is possible, and thank you, sir, he added, again pressing the elder man's hand. Arissa took Mr. Cumberford's hand next. She did not express her gratitude in words, but the man understood her, and, to hide his embarrassment, began to search for his cigarette case. As for Sybil, she regarded the scene with an amused smile, and there was a queer look in her dark eyes. "'Now,' said Arissa, "'let us go in to breakfast. You must all be nearly famished.' "'Yes, let us eat, so that I can get back to town,' agreed Mr. Cumberford cheerfully. "'The campaign begins this very morning, and it may take a few people by surprise. Remember, Steve, you are to stand ready to carry out any plans your manager makes.' I understand, sir. End of chapter. Chapter 16 of The Flying Girl. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christy Lufer. The Flying Girl. By L. Frank Baum. Chapter 16 The Opening Gun. Sybil rode with her father into town. On the way, she said, You puzzle me. One would imagine you are playing fair with the canes. Mere imagination, he returned gruffly. Yes, she agreed. Your nature is to plot and intrigue. The deeper and more stealthy and unsuspected the plot, the more characteristic it is of my subtle parent. True, he said. But here is a condition that puzzles me, as I have remarked. I understand how you won the confidence of the Canes, by posing as generous and unselfish. That was quite like you. But today you had them in your power. You might have demanded anything, everything. Yet you accepted a mere ten per cent. Now I'm really wondering what your game is. It was evident he did not relish his daughter's criticism, for his usually placid brow bore a heavy frown. Still, he answered lightly, You're stirring too deep. You're roiling the pot. Why don't you look on the surface? Oh, how stupid of me! she said in a relieved voice. "'To be a diverse scoundrel,' announced her father, "'is the acme of diabolic art. From complication to simplicity is but a step, yet requires audacity. Most rascals fail to realize that an honest act, by way of contrast, affords more satisfaction than persistent chicanery will produce. We must have variety in our pleasures in order to get the most from them.' "'To be sure,' said Sybil. "'Meantime, you are forgetting your Uncle Burthon.' They rode in silence for a time. The girl nestled a little closer to her father's side and murmured, "'I'm mighty glad, Daddy. I like the canes.' "'So do I,' he responded. "'And isn't Stephen's aeroplane marvellous?' "'I consider it,' said he, the cleverest and most important invention of the age. By eight o'clock, a skillful photographer was on his way to Stephen Kane's hangar to get pictures of the aircraft, while Mr. Cumberford sat in the office of a noted advertising expert and bargained for an amount of publicity that fairly made the man's head swim. The city editors of all the morning papers were next interviewed and interested in the Cumberford campaign, so that half a dozen reporters, who were noted for their brilliant descriptive writing, 
attended a luncheon given by Mr. Cumberford at the Aero Club, and listened to his glowing accounts of the Kane aircraft and the wonderful flight made by its inventor that very morning. For fear Mr. Burthon might drop into the club during this session, the cautious manager of the aircraft had taken the precaution to have Brewster telephone him to come to the South Pasadena workshop and to keep him there by some pretext till late in the day. This was done. Mr. Burthon spent an entire afternoon with his imitation aircraft, returning to Los Angeles for a late dinner at his club. Then, being very tired, he went to bed early. At breakfast next morning he picked up a newspaper, started as his eye fell upon the lurid headlines, and nearly fainted with chagrin and anger. Upon the first page was a large picture of the Kane aircraft, with a vignette of its inventor in an upper corner, and columns of description and enthusiastic comment regarding his creation, which was heralded as a distinct forward stride in practical aviation. Stephen's remarkable flight was referred to and promise made of an exhibition soon to be held at Dominguez Field, where the public would be given an opportunity to see the aircraft in action. Mr. Burthon, as soon as he could recover himself, read every word carefully. Then he smoked his cigar and thought it over. Half an hour later he was making the rounds of the evening papers, but found he was unable to kill the articles prepared to exploit the Kane aircraft. The morning papers, having devoted so much space to the subject, the afternoon papers could not possibly ignore it, and finding he was helpless in this attempt, he followed another tack. Entering the office of the secretary of the Aero Club, he said, "'I believe our contract with the owners of Dominguez Field provides that the Aero Club may have use of the grounds whenever it so desires, regardless of any other engagements by outsiders.' "'Certainly,' replied the secretary. "'I remember you yourself insisted upon that condition "'as chairman of the Committee on Arrangements. "'Please notify the manager that we require Dominguez Field "'for club purposes every day for the next two weeks.' "'But, Mr. Burthon, think of the expense.' "'I shall personally pay all charges.' "'Very well.' "'The secretary telephoned, and was informed that the field had been engaged that morning for the coming Saturday by a Mr. Cumberford, an Aero Club member. But Mr. Burthon insisted on the rights of the club as an organization, and the manager agreed to cancel Cumberford's engagement. From there, Mr. Burthon went to the managers of the Motor Dome, the baseball parks, and Luna, engaging every open date for two weeks to come. Then, having practically tied up every available place where the Kane aircraft might be publicly exhibited, he sighed contentedly and went to his South Pasadena workshop to hasten the completion of his own aeroplane. Mr. Cumberford was annoyed when he received notice that he could not have Dominguez Field for any day previous to the aviation meet. He was further annoyed by the discovery that Burthon had engaged every public amusement park in the vicinity of Los Angeles. But, he was not the man to despair in such an emergency. The contest between him and his hated brother-in-law merely sharpened his wits and rendered him more alert. He found a broad, vacant field on the Santa Monica car line, arranged with the street railway company to carry the people there for a five-cent fare, and tied up his deals with contracts so that Burthon would be unable to interfere. Then he ordered a large grandstand to be built, and instead of fencing in the grounds, determined to make the exhibition absolutely free to all who cared to attend. These arrangements completed, Mr. Cumberford announced in glaring advertisements the dates of the exhibition, and decided he had won the game. Mr. Burthon tried to enjoin the exhibition, claiming that Stephen Kane's aircraft was an infringement on his own device. But Stephen personally appeared before the judge and convinced him that there was nothing to the assertion. Of course, Mr. Cumberford saw that the newspapers had full accounts of these proceedings, and so public interest was keyed up to the highest pitch when Saturday arrived. The cars on that day were taxed to their fullest capacity to carry the crowds to Kane Park, as the new aviation field was called. A large and attractive hangar had been constructed on the field, and Stephen, on the morning of the exhibition, flew his aeroplane from Marston's pasture to Kane Park, 
alighting successfully just before the hangar. Orissa, Sybil, and Mr. Cumberford were there to receive him, and after placing the aircraft safely in the new hangar, they all motored to town for breakfast at the Alexandria. It was no longer possible for Steve to take entire personal charge of his invention, so Mr. Cumberford, having made a careful search, was finally able to secure two men, who until that time had been strangers to one another, as assistants. These men were skilled mechanics and recommended as honest and reliable, which perhaps they were under ordinary circumstances. Their names were Wilson and Reed. As they had already been two days in Stephen's workshop, and were now thoroughly conversant with their duties, these two men were left at the hangar in charge of the aeroplane, with instructions to watch it carefully, and allow no one to enter or to examine it. Steve needed rest, for he had worked night and day preparing for this important public test. The exhibition was to be held at two o'clock, so he reluctantly acceded to Mr. Cumberford's request that he lie down in a quiet room at the hotel and sleep until he was called to lunch. End of chapter 16「Chapter Seventeen of the Flying Girl. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Flying Girl by L. Frank Baum. Chapter Seventeen: A Curious Accident. Orissa had not been at all nervous over the event at Kane Park until the hour when she entered the field and noted the tremendous throng assembled to witness her brother's much-heralded flight. The band was playing vigorously, and many gay banners waved over the grandstand, and the big hangar wherein the aircraft was hidden. Then, indeed, she began to realize the importance of the occasion, and her heart throbbed with pride to think that Steve was the hero all awaited, and that his name would be famous from this time forth. This was the 17th of December, and on January 1st the great international aviation meet was to be held at Los Angeles, with such famous aviators present as the Wright brothers, Glenn Curtis, Hubert Latham, Arch Hoxie, their old friend Willard, Parmalee, Eli, Brookins, Radley, and many others. Mr. Cumberford had entered Stephen Kane for this important meet, and the young man was booked to take part in the endurance and speed tests, and to make an attempt to break the world's record for altitude, all in his own flyer, the Kane aircraft. So swift a transition from obscurity to popularity, or at least to the attention of the civilized world, was enough to turn the head of any one. But as yet, Steve seemed all unaware of his own importance. Disregarding the crowds, which were eagerly seeking a glimpse of the young aviator, but did not know him, he quietly made his way to the hangar, and was admitted by Wilson, who guarded the doorway from an insistent group demanding a peep at the aeroplane. Steve took off his coat, made a thorough inspection of all the working parts, and then put on his close-fitting cap and goggles, buttoned a sweater over his chest, and nodded to his men to throw back the entrance curtains. Two policemen cleared the way, and as the aviator drew back his lever, the aircraft rolled out of the hangar into full view of the multitude. A shout went up, handkerchiefs were waved, and the band played frantically. On its big wheels, which were almost large enough for a motor-car, the aeroplane sped across the field, turned, passed the grandstand, and with accelerating speed dashed away to the farther end of the field. A murmur arose, in which surprise and disappointment were intermingled. One fat gentleman, who had been patiently waiting for two hours, "'Why, it's only a sort of automobile with crossed airplanes set over it. I thought they claimed the thing could fly.' Those who knew something of aviation, however, were the ones astonished at Steve's preliminary performance. They realized the advantage of being able to drive an aeroplane on its own wheels, as an automobile goes, in case of emergencies. And moreover, the crossed planes, a distinct innovation in construction, gave them considerable food for thought. Usually, the two surfaces, or floats, of a biplane are exactly parallel, one above the other. But in Steve's machine, the upper plane ran fore and aft, while the lower one extended sidewise. At a glance it was possible to see the advantage of this arrangement as a duplex balance, which, with the swinging wing-ends, comprised the safety device that the inventor believed made his aeroplane superior to any other. 
From the far end of the field, Steve swung around and started back, straight for the grandstand. He had nearly reached it when he threw in the clutch that started the propellers and at the same time slightly elevated the front rudder. Up like a bird taking wing rose the aircraft, soaring above the grandstand and then describing a series of circles over the field. Gradually it ascended, as if the aviator was ascending an aerial spiral staircase, until he had mounted so far among the clouds that only a grayish speck was discernible. The spectators held their breaths in anxious suspense. The speck grew larger. Swooping down at a sharp angle, the aircraft came suddenly into view and within a hundred feet of the ground resumed its normal position and began to circle around the field again. Now a mighty cheer went up and Orissa, who had been pressing Sybil's hand with a grip that made her wince, found herself sobbing with joy. Her brother's former flights had been almost as successful as this, but only now, with the plaudits of a multitude ringing in her ears, did she realize the wonderful thing he had accomplished. But on a sudden the shout was stilled. A startled, frightened moan ran through the assemblage. Women screamed, men paled, and more than one onlooker turned sick and faint. For the Kane aircraft, while gracefully gliding along in full view of all, was seen to suddenly collapse and crumple like a pricked toy balloon. Aeroplane and aviator fell together in a shapeless mass toward the earth, and the sight was enough to dismay the stoutest heart. But Steve's salvation lay in his altitude at the time of the accident. Fifty feet from the earth, the automatic planes asserted their surfaces against the air, and arrested to an appreciable extent the plunge. Had it been a hundred feet instead of fifty, the young man might have escaped without injury, but the damaged machine had acquired so great a momentum that it landed with a shock that unseated young Kane and threw him underneath the weight of the motor and gasoline tank. A dozen ready hands promptly released him from the wreck, but when they tried to lift him to his feet, he could not stand. His leg was broken. End of chapter 17《Chapter eighteen of the Flying Girl This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Fascio. The Flying Girl by L. Frank Baum. Chapter eighteen The One to Blame. Mr. Cumberford locked the doors of the hangar and refused to admit anyone but his own daughter. Even Reed and Wilson, having assisted to drag the wreck to its shed, were ordered peremptorily to keep out. Wilson obeyed without protest, but Reed was angry and said it was his duty to put the aircraft into shape again. Cumberford listened to him quietly, listened to his declaration that he had had nothing to do with the construction of the aeroplane and therefore could in no way be held responsible for the accident, and after the man had had his say, the employer asked him to come to his hotel in the evening to consider what should be done. He also made an appointment with Wilson. Then he shut himself up in the hangar with Sybil. Orissa had gone with Steve in the ambulance to the hospital, where she remained by his side until the leg was set and the young man felt fairly comfortable. The injury was not very painful but Steve was in great mental distress, because his accident would prevent his taking part in the aviation meet. All their carefully made plans for the successful promotion of the Kane aircraft were rendered futile by this sudden reverse of fortune, and the youthful inventor constantly bewailed the fact that Berthon would now have a clear field and his own career be ignominiously ended. Orissa had little to say in reply, for her own heart was aching and she saw no way to comfort her brother. When he was settled in his little white room, with the skillful nurse in attendance, the girl went home to break the sad news to their blind mother. Meantime, Mr. Cumberford was busy at the hangar. In spite of his usual nonchalance and obtuse manner, both carefully assumed, the man had a thorough understanding of mechanics, and by this time knew every detail of young Kane's aeroplane quite intimately. Also, he was a shrewd and logical reasoner, and well knew the accident had been due to some cause other than faulty parts or inherent weakness of the aircraft. So he took off his coat, rolled up his shirt sleeves, and began a careful examination of the wreck. It was Sybil, however, who stood staring at the airplane, always fascinating to her, who first discovered the cause of Steve's catastrophe. 
"'See here, Daddy,' she exclaimed. "'The sky wire has been cut half through, in some way, and others are broken entirely.' Mr. Cumberford came to her side and inspected the guy wire. The girl was right. It was certainly odd that several strands of the slender but strong woven wire cable had parted. Her father took a small magnifying glass from his pocket and examined the cut with care. "'It has been filed,' he announced. Sybil nodded, but she seemed absent-minded and to have lost interest in the discovery. "'From the first I suspected the guy wires,' she said. When the aircraft collapsed, I knew the wires had parted, and then I thought of my clever uncle. Mr. Cumberford rolled down his sleeves and put on his coat. Three of the wires gave way, he observed, and it's a wonder young Kane wasn't killed. Come, Bill, we'll go back to the hotel. They found the field deserted, their motor car being the last on the grounds. During the ride into town, Sybil remarked, This affair will cause you serious loss, Daddy. Why? Steve can't exhibit his device at the meet, and Uncle Berthon will be on hand to win all the laurels. Don't worry over that, he said grimly. We've ten days in which to outwit Berthon, and if I can't manage to do it in that time, I deserve to lose my money. Wilson came to the hotel promptly at eight o'clock for his interview with Mr. Cumberford. Said that gentleman, Tell me all that happened at the hangar after we left you and Reed there this morning. The man seemed reluctant at first but finally decided to tell the truth. He appeared to be an honest young fellow, but knew quite well that his testimony would injure his fellow assistant. It was quite early, sir, when an automobile came into the field and a gentleman asked to see the aircraft. Mr. Reed was at the door at the time, and I heard him reply that no one could be admitted. Then the gentleman said something to him in a low voice, and Reed, after a little hesitation, turned to me and told me to guard the door. I did so, and the two walked away together. I saw them in close conversation for quite a while, and then Reed came back to the hangar and said, The gentleman is having trouble with his motor car. Wilson, and one of his engines is working badly. You understand such things. Go and see if you can help him while I guard the door. I thought that was queer, sir, for Reed is as good a mechanic as I am, but I took a wrench and walked over to the automobile, which was not a hundred yards distant. A little dried-up chauffeur was in the driver's seat. The gentleman asked me to test the engines, which I did, and found there was nothing wrong with them at all. I hadn't been a bit suspicious until then, but this set me thinking, and I hurried back to the hangar. I hadn't been away ten minutes, and I found Reed standing in the doorway quietly smoking his pipe. Everything about the aircraft seemed all right, so I said nothing to Reed except that his friend was a ringer and up to some trick. He answered that the man was no friend of his, that he had never seen him before, and was not likely to see him again. That is all, sir. I didn't leave the hangar again until Mr. Kane returned and took charge of it. Mr. Cumberford had listened intently. Do you know the name of the man with the automobile? he asked. No, sir. Describe him, please. Wilson described Berthon with fair accuracy. Thank you. You may go now. But I want you on hand tomorrow morning to assist in getting the machine back to Kane's old hangar. Very well, sir. Reed came half an hour after Wilson had left. His attitude was swaggering and defiant. Mr. Cumberford said to him, Reed, your action in filing the guy wires is a crime that will be classed as attempted manslaughter. You are liable to imprisonment for life. The man grew pale, but recovering himself, replied, I didn't file the wires. You can't prove it. I'm going to try anyway, declared Cumberford. That is, unless you confess the truth, in which case I'll prosecute Berthon instead of you. Reed stared at him, but stubbornly made no reply. "'How much did he pay you for the work?' continued Cumberford. "'No answer.' Mr. Cumberford touched a bell, and a detective entered. "'Officer, I accuse this man of an attempt to murder Stephen Kane,' said he. "'You overheard the recent interview in this room, and understand the case perfectly, and the evidence on which I base my charge. You will arrest Mr. Reed, if you please.' The officer took the man in charge. Reed was nervous and evidently terrified, but maintained a stubborn silence. "'Confession may save you,' suggested Cumberford, but Reed was pursuing some plan previously determined on, and would not speak. So the officer led him away. Next morning, the wrecked aeroplane was transferred to the workshop in the cane garden, where Wilson, under the supervision of Orissa and Mr. Cumberford, began taking it apart that they might estimate the damage it had sustained. 
Orissa's face bore a serious but determined expression, and she directed the work as intelligently as Steve could have done. Cumberford, who had brought a pair of overalls, worked beside Wilson, and in a few hours they were able to tell exactly which repairs were necessary. "'The motors are not much injured,' announced Orissa, "'and that is indeed fortunate. We need one new propeller blade, five bows and struts for the lower plane, new wing ends and guy wires, and almost a complete new running gear. It isn't so very bad, sir.' With the extra parts we have on hand, I believe the aircraft can be put in perfect condition before the meet. Good, exclaimed Mr. Cumberford. Then our greatest need is to secure a competent aviator. To operate Stephen's machine? Of course. He's out of commission, poor lad, but the machine must fly nevertheless. Orissa's blue eyes regarded him gravely. She had been considering this proposition ever since the accident. Our first task, said she, is to get my brother's invention thoroughly repaired. But the question of the aviator is fully as important, persisted her friend. Wilson, turning to the mechanic, do you think you could operate the aircraft? Me, sir, replied the man, with a startled look. I, I'm afraid not. I understand it, of course, but I've had no experience. No one but Stephen Kane can claim to have had experience with this device, said Mr. Cumberford, so someone must operate it who is, as yet, wholly inexperienced. "'Can't you find an aviator who has used other machines, sir?' asked Wilson. "'The city is full of them just now.' "'I'll try,' was the answer. Mr. Cumberford did try. After engaging another mechanic to assist Wilson, he interviewed every aviator he could find in Los Angeles. But all with the slightest experience in aerial navigation were engaged by the various aeroplane manufacturers to operate their devices, or had foreign machines of their own which were entered for competition." He was referred to several ambitious and fearless men who would willingly undertake to fly the cane invention, but he feared to trust them with so important a duty. Returning one day in a rather discouraged mood to Orissa, who was busy directing her men, he said, I have always until now been able to find a man for any purpose I required, but the art of flying is in its infancy, and the few bold spirits who have entered the game are all tied up and unavailable. It looks very much as if we are going to have a winning aeroplane with no one to develop its possibilities. Orissa was tightening a turnbuckle. She looked up and said with a smile, The aviator is already provided, sir. What? You have found him? exclaimed Mr. Cumberford. I ought to have said aviatress, I suppose, laughed the girl. My daughter? Nonsense. Oh, Sybil would undertake it if I had let her, replied Orissa but I dare not trust anyone but myself. There is too much at stake. You? Just Orissa Kane. I've been to the hospital this morning and talked with Steve, and he quite approves my idea. Mr. Cumberford looked at the slight, delicate form with an expression of wonder. The girl seemed so dainty, so beautiful, so very feminine and youthful, that her suggestion to risk her life in an airship was positively absurd. You've a fine nerve, my child, he remarked with a sigh. And I've no doubt you would undertake the thing if I'd give my consent. But of course I can't do that. Why not? You're not fit. In what way? Why, strength and experience. Girls don't fly, my dear. They simply encourage the men to risk their necks. Pooh! There's no danger, asserted Orissa scornfully. One is as safe in the cane aircraft as in a trundle bed. Yet Steve... Oh, one may be murdered in bed, you know, as well as in an airplane. Had those guy wires not been tampered with, an accident to my brother would have been impossible. Have you stopped to consider, sir, that even when the plane separated and crumpled under the air pressure, Steve's device asserted its ability to float and drop gently to the ground? Steve managed to get hurt because he fell under the weight of the motors. That was all. Really, sir, I can't imagine anything safer than the aircraft. And as for brawn and muscle... You know very well that little strength is required in an aviator. Skill is called for, a clear head and a quick eye, and these qualities I possess. Hmm. You think you can manage the thing? I know it, absolutely. I've talked over with Steve every detail from the very beginning and have personally tested all the working parts time and again, except in actual flight. And you're not afraid? Not in the least. You won't faint when you find yourself among the clouds? Not a faint, sir. It isn't in me. Mr. Cumberford fell silent and solemn. He began to seriously consider the proposition. 
End chapter 18. Chapter 19 of The Flying Girl. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Fascio. The Flying Girl by L. Frank Baum. Chapter 19 Planning the Campaign. That evening, the secretary of the Aero Club telephoned Mr. Cumberford to ask if he wished to withdraw his entry from contest in the coming aviation meet. By no means, was the reply. But you state that Kane is to be the aviator, and we are informed that Kane has a broken leg. Leave the entry as it stands. Kane, aviator, said Cumberford positively. Very well, sir, returned the secretary, evidently puzzled. But his friend Burthon, who had suggested his telephoning, was highly pleased when he learned Mr. Cumberford's decision. All right, he observed with satisfaction. We'll leave the Kane aircraft on the program, for everyone is talking of the wonderful device, and the announcement of its competition will be the greatest drawing card we have. But the entry of Kane Aviator will disqualify anyone but Kane from operating the aircraft, and I happen to know his leg is in a plaster cast, and he cannot use it for months to come. "'Won't it hurt us to disqualify the Kane aircraft and have it withdrawn at the last moment?' inquired the secretary doubtfully. "'No, for I'm going to spring on the crowd the greatest surprise of the century, Burthon's biplane.' "'Are you sure of its success, sir?' "'Absolutely. Kane copied his machine from mine, as I have before explained to you, and in addition to all the good points he has exhibited, I have the advantage of a perfect automatic balance.' If Kane's device had been equipped with it, he wouldn't have fallen the other day. Perhaps Mr. Burthon was sincere in saying this. He had had no opportunity to examine Stephen's latest creation at close quarters, but on the day of the trial at Kane Park he had observed the fact that Stephen had abandoned the automatic balance he had first patented, and now had recourse to crossed planes. Both Burthon and his mechanics considered the original device the best and most practical, and they depended upon it for the biggest advertisement of Burthon's improved biplane, having of course no hint that Stephen had tested it and found it sadly lacking. On the 26th the Burthon flyer was ready for trial, and Tot Tyler, after several attempts, got it into the air and made a short flight that filled the heart of Mr. Burthon with elation. "'Curtis and the Wrights will do better than that, though,' observed the ex-chauffeur, "'to say nothing of those daredevils Latham and Hoxie. I'll improve it after a few more trials, but I can't promise ever to do better than the other fellows do. That isn't to be expected, returned Burthon. I'm not backing you to excel the performance of the old aviators. That isn't my point. The improvements and novelties we have to show will take the wind out of the sails of all the other airplanes and result in a flood of orders. Comparing machine for machine were years in advance of the Wrights and Curtis, and centuries ahead of those foreign devices. Perhaps admitted Tot, but Kane's airplane is practically the same as your own, and it is still on the program. It won't fly, though, declared Burthon with a laugh. Don't worry about anything but your own work, Tyler. Leave all the rest to me. The man knew his employer was playing a hazardous game, and that he had stolen outright the Kane aircraft, and while the knowledge did not add to Tot Tyler's nerve or assurance, he was gleeful over the prospect of doing his enemy Cumberford. The little fellow was bold enough, even to the point of bravery, and fully as unprincipled as his employer. His hatred of Cumberford was so acrid that he would have gone to any length, even without pay, to defeat his plans, and Burthon found him an eager and willing tool. Nevertheless, the little man scented danger ahead of them, and had an idea that trouble was brewing from some unknown source. By this time, Burthon had begun a campaign of widespread publicity, and in spite of the long list of famous aviators in the city, the newspapers were filled with pictures of Burthon's device and accounts of the marvelous flights of Totham Tyler. Nothing more was heard of the Kane aircraft, but the public had not forgotten it, and many were puzzled that two local airplane makers should be exhibiting identically the same improvements, each claiming to have originated them. As for the visiting aviators, they were interested, but held their peace. The performances at the coming competition would tell the story of supremacy, and whatever good points were displayed by the local inventors could doubtless be adapted to their own craft. They waited, therefore, for proof of the glowing claims made in the newspapers. Many promising inventions have turned out to be failures. 
The public was, to an extent, in the same doubting mood. Kane's magnificent public flight had ended with an accident, while Tyler's preliminary exhibitions were in no way remarkable as compared with records already established. The meat would tell the story. Meantime, Orissa completed her repairs. On the day that Steve came home from the hospital in an ambulance, she wheeled him in an invalid chair to the hangar, and allowed the boy to inspect a perfect aircraft. The young man suffered no pain, and although he was physically helpless, his eye and brain were as keen as ever. Being wheeled around the device, so that he could observe it from all sides and at all angles, he made a thorough examination of his sister's work, and declared it excellent. "'Think you can manage it, Riss?' he asked, referring to her proposed venture. "'I am sure I can,' she promptly replied. "'You must understand, all of you,' turning to confront Mr. Cumberford and Sybil, who were present, "'that I am not undertaking this flight from choice. "'Had Steve been able to exhibit his own airplane, "'I might never have tried to fly alone. "'But it seems to me that our fortune, my brother's future career, "'and our friend Mr. Cumberford's investment,' all hinge upon our making a good showing at Dominguez Field. No one but me is competent to properly exhibit the aircraft, to show all its good points, and to prove what it is capable of doing. Therefore I have undertaken to save our reputation and our money, and I am sure that my decision is proper and right. I agree with you, said Steve eagerly. You are a brave little girl, Riss. I have but one request to make, Mr. Cumberford, she added. What is it, Orissa? he inquired. Do not advertise me as the girl aviator, or by any other such name. I prefer people should remain ignorant of the fact that a girl is operating the Kane aircraft. Can't you keep quiet about it? I can, and will, he asserted. Indeed, my dear, I much prefer that course. It will be all the more interesting when, when, the discovery is made. I do not wish to become a celebrity, she said seriously. One in the family is enough, glancing proudly at Steve, and I'm afraid nice people would think me unmaidenly and bold to become a public aviator. I'm not at all freakish, indeed I'm not, and only stern necessity induces me to face this ordeal. My dear, said Mr. Cumberford, looking at her admiringly, your feelings shall be considered in every possible way, but you must not imagine you are the first female aviator. In Europe, especially in France, a score of women have made successful flights, and not one is considered unwomanly or has forfeited any claim to the world's respect and applause. The most successful aviators of the future, remarked Stephen thoughtfully, are bound to be women. As a rule they are lighter than men, more supple and active, quick of perception and less liable to lose their heads in emergencies. The operation of an airplane is, it seems to me, especially fitted to women. Ah! exclaimed Sybil, with a whimsical glance at the speaker. I have discovered my future vocation. I shall aviate parties of atmospheric tourists. When the passengers' airships are introduced, I'll become the original Sky Motoress, and so win fame and fortune. Steve laughed, but shook his head. The airship of the future will not be a passenger affair, he predicted, but an individual machine for personal use. They'll be cheaper than automobiles, and more useful, for they can go direct to their destination in a straight air line. Men will use them to go to business, women to visit town on shopping expeditions, or to take an airing for pleasure. But I'm sure they will be built for but one person. Then I'll have one, and become a freelance in the sky, roaming where I will, declared Sybil. This unconventional girl had developed a decided fancy for the inventor, and while in his presence it was noticed that she became less reserved and mysterious than at other times. Steve liked Sybil, too, although she was so strong a contrast to his own beautiful sister. When she cared to be agreeable, Miss Cumberford proved interesting, and was, Steve thought, good company. Orissa observed that Sybil invariably presented the best side of her character to Steve. While he was in the hospital, the girl visited him daily, and now that he had come home again, she passed most of her time at the hangar. Mr. Cumberford was greatly annoyed to learn that the Kane headquarters at Dominguez Field had been given a location in the rear of all the others, where it would be practically unnoticed. Of course, this slight was attributed to Burthon's influence with the Committee of Arrangements, of which he was a member. Burthon's own hangar, on the contrary, had a very prominent position. From his man Brewster, 
as well as from others, Mr. Cumberford also learned that Burthon had hinted he would prevent the Kane aircraft from taking any part in the contests. All these things worried the Kane party, whose anxieties would have been sufficient had they not been forced to encounter the petty malice of Burthon. Sybil, silently listening to all that was said, assumed a more mysterious air than usual, and on the day previous to the opening of the great aviation meet, she informed her father that she would not accompany him to Dominguez, where he was bound to attend to all final preparations. The decision surprised him, but being accustomed to his daughter's sudden whims, he made no reply, and left her in their rooms at the hotel. End chapter 19 Chapter 20 of The Flying Girl. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Fascio. The Flying Girl by L. Frank Baum. Chapter 20 Uncle and Niece. When her father had gone, Sybil addressed a note to Mr. Burthon, which read, I will call upon you at your club for a private interview at twelve o'clock precisely. As all your future depends upon this meeting, you will not fail to keep the appointment. She signed this message with the initials S.C., and Mr. Burthon, receiving it as he was about to start for Dominguez in his motor-car, for the messenger had had a lively chase over town to catch him, read and re-read the epistle carefully, was thoughtful a moment, and then ordered his man to drive him to the club. S. C., he mused. Who on earth can it be? A woman's handwriting, of course, crude and unformed. When women intrigue, there is usually a reason for it. Better find out what's in the wind, even at the loss of a little valuable time. That's the safest plan. He reached his club at exactly twelve o'clock, and heard a woman inquiring for him of the doorkeeper. He met her, bowed, and without a word led her to his own private sitting-room on the third floor. The woman— or was it a girl, was, he observed, heavily veiled, but as soon as they were alone she removed the veil and looked at him steadfastly from a pair of dark, luminous eyes. Mr. Burthon shifted uneasily in his chair. He had never seen the girl before, yet there was something singularly familiar in her features. "'Be good enough to tell me who you are,' he said in the gentle tone he invariably employed toward women. "'I have granted this interview at your request, but I am very busy today, and have little time to spare you.' "'I am your niece,' she replied, slowly and deliberately. "'Oh!' he exclaimed, then paused to observe her curiously. "'So you are my sister Marion's daughter?' "'Exactly. "'I knew she had a child, for often she wrote me about it. "'But her early death and my estrangement with your father "'prevented me from seeing you until now. "'Your mother, my dear, was a, a noble woman.' "'You are not telling the truth,' said Sybil quietly. "'She was quite the contrary.' He started and flushed. Then he replied, somewhat confused by the girl's scornful regard. At least I loved her. She was my only sister. And your accomplice? Eh? He stared aghast. Then quickly recovering himself, he remarked. You were rather too young when she died to judge your mother's character correctly. It is true, but I remember her with abhorrence. Your father, on the other hand, observed Mr. Burthon, his face hardening, might well deserve your hatred and aversion. He is a scoundrel. I have heard him say so, replied Sybil, smiling. But I do not believe it. In any event, his iniquity could not equal that of the Burthons. We are complimentary, said her uncle, returning the smile with seeming amusement. But I regret to say I have no time to further converse with you today. Will you call again, if you have anything special to say to me? No, replied Sybil. You must listen to me today. "'Tomorrow.' "'Tomorrow,' she interrupted, "'you may be in prison. "'It is not easy to interview criminals in jail, is it?' He looked at her now with more than curiosity. His gaze was searching, half-fearful, inquiring. "'You speak foolishly,' said he. "'Yet you understand me perfectly,' she returned. "'I confess that I do not,' he coldly persisted. "'Then I must explain,' said she. When my mother died I was but eight years of age, but I was old for my years, and on her deathbed your sister placed in my hands a sealed envelope, directing me to guard it carefully and secretly, and not to open it until I was eighteen years of age. 
and not then unless I had in some way incurred the enmity and persecution of my uncle, George Burthon. She said it was her confession. He sat perfectly still, as if turned to stone, his eyes fixed full upon the girl's face. With an effort, he said, in a soft voice, Have I persecuted you? Indirectly, yes. But you cannot be eighteen yet. No, she admitted, I am only seventeen. He breathed a sigh of relief. Then, But I am half a burthen, Sybil continued, and therefore have little respect for the wishes of others, especially when they interfere with my own desires. I kept the letter my mother gave me, but had no interest in opening it until the other day. And you read it then? Two or three times, perhaps half a dozen, with great care. Where is that letter now? Where you cannot find it, clever as you are. I may say I have great respect for your cleverness, my dear uncle, since reading the letter. How paltry the story of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde seems after knowing you. He moved uneasily in his seat. But the man was on the defensive now, and eyed his accuser steadily. "'You seem much like your mother,' he suggested reflectively. "'But you are wrong. I am more like my father.' He shrugged his shoulders. "'What matter, my child? You have a rare inheritance on either side.' They sat in silence a moment. Then he said, "'You have not yet confided in me your errand.' "'True.' I have a request to make, which I am sure you will comply with. You must stop annoying the canes. He smiled at her. You have marked them for your own prey, you and your precious father. Yes, your persecution must cease, and at once. He seemed thoughtful. I have an end in view, said he. An important end. I know. You want to force Arissa to marry you. But that is absurd. She is scarcely half your age, and— she despises you. He flushed at this. Nevertheless, I won't have it, cried Sybil sternly. And another thing, you must withdraw your airplane from the aviation meet tomorrow. Must? I used the word advisedly. I have the power to compel you to obey me, and I intend to use it. He sat watching her with his eyes slightly narrowed. Sybil was absolutely composed. Your mother, my dear, he presently remarked, was a charming woman, but inclined to be visionary and imaginative. I have no idea what she wrote in that letter. But if it is anything that asperses my character, my integrity or fairness, it is not true, and can only be accounted for by the fact that the poor creature was driven insane by your father, and did not know what she was doing. Oh, indeed, the girl retorted. Is it not true, then, that you were convicted in Baltimore twenty years ago of a dastardly murder and robbery, and sentenced by the court to life imprisonment? Is it not true that my mother at that time contrived your escape, and secreted you so cleverly that the officers of the law could never find you? It is not true, he declared, speaking with apparent effort. The letter states that you were arrested and convicted under the name of Harcliffe, and when active search for you was finally abandoned, you went with my mother to Chicago, and there began a new life under your right name of Burthon, that there your sister met and married my father, although you opposed the match bitterly, fearing she would betray your secret to her husband. But she never did. It is not true, he repeated. The whole story is but a tissue of lies. Then, said Sybil, I will telegraph to the police of Baltimore that the escaped prisoner Harcliffe, whom they have been seeking these twenty years, is here in Los Angeles, and ask them to send at once someone to identify him. You need not be afraid, for the story is false. They will come. I will point you out to them, and they will declare you are not the man. Then I will believe you, not before. He sat a long time, his head upon his hand, looking at her reflectively. At the same time her dark eyes were fixed upon him with equal intentness. By and by she laughed aloud, but there was no mirth in the sound. "'Not that, my dear uncle,' she said, as if he had spoken. "'Am I not the mother's daughter, and my clever uncle's own niece? "'You cannot quiet me by murder, for in that case my revenge is fully provided for. "'I know you, and I did not venture upon this disagreeable errand unprepared. "'There is a plain clothesman at the street door who, if I do not emerge from this club in—' "'She looked at her watch.' In fifteen minutes we'll summon assistance, guard every exit, and then search your rooms for my body. The doorkeeper has my name and knows that I am here. 
Therefore, to injure me now would be to thrust your head into the hangman's noose. Afterward you will be very considerate of my welfare, for from this day any harm that befalls me will lead to your prompt arrest and the disclosure of your secret. He threw out his hands with a despairing, helpless gesture. "'What a demon you are!' he cried. "'I believe I am,' said Sybil slowly. "'I hate myself for being obliged to act in this dramatic fashion, to threaten and bully like a coward, but being blessed with so unscrupulous an uncle I cannot accomplish my purpose in a more dignified way.' "'State your demands, then,' said he. "'I have stated them. "'To withdraw my airplane from the aviation meet would mean my ruin. I have sold my real estate and brokerage business, and invested my money in aviation. I positively cannot withdraw now. You must. To whine of ruin is absurd. I know that my father paid you a quarter of a million for your mine. You also obtained, without doubt, a good sum for your business. So far you cannot have invested more than a few thousand dollars in your attempt to steal Stephen Kane's invention. My advice, sir, is to get away from here as soon as you can. Go to London or Paris, where there is more interest in aviation than here, and make a business of flying, if you will. But the cane device is fully protected by foreign patents, and any infringement will be promptly prosecuted. "'You are merciless,' he complained. "'You will find me so.' "'I am a member of the Aero Club. I cannot, without arousing suspicion, withdraw my aeroplane from the meet. "'If you do not, I will telegraph to Baltimore.' The threat seemed to crush him, and still any further remonstrances. "'Very well,' he returned. "'If you have finished your errand, please leave me. I must consider my position.' She rose, cast one scornful glance at him, and walked out of the room, leaving him seated with bowed head, dejected, and utterly defeated. End chapter 20《Chapter Twenty One of the Flying Girl》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Fascio. The Flying Girl by L. Frank Baum. Chapter Twenty One Mr. H. Chesterton Radley Todd. There lived in Los Angeles at that time one of those unaccountable individuals whom nature, in fashioning, endows with such contradictory qualities that their fellow creatures are unable to judge them correctly. He was a young man, fresh from college, whose name was engraved upon his cards as H. Chesterton Radley Todd, but whom his new acquaintances promptly dubbed Chesty Todd. Having finished his collegiate course, he had been at a loss what to do next. So he drifted to the Pacific coast and presently connected himself with the Los Angeles Tribune as literary critic, society reporter, and general panistic rustabout. Mr. Radley Todd had a round, baby face, expressionless and therefore innocent blue eyes that bulged a little, charmingly perfect teeth, an awkward demeanor, a stumbling, hesitating mode of speech, and the intellectual acumen of a Disraeli. He was six feet and three inches tall, and dressed like a dandy. People estimated him as a mollycoddle at first acquaintance, wondering presently if he had possessed hidden talents, and finally gave him up as a problem not worth solving. No one believed in his ability, even when he demonstrated it, because, as they truly said, he did not look as if he amounted to shucks. That such a callow youth, predoomed to adverse judgment, should be able to secure a position on a daily paper seemed remarkable. But the Tribune loves to employ green and budding talent, which can be had at a nominal salary. The managing editor shrewdly contends that these young fellows work with an enthusiasm and perseverance unknown to older and more experienced journalists, because they have a notion that the world is their oyster, and a newspaper job the knife that opens it. When they discover their mistake, they are dismissed, and other ambitious ones take their places. Mr. H. Chesterton Radley Todd was at present enjoying this fleeting prominence, and occasionally the editor would read his copy with genuine amazement, and wonder from what source he had stolen its brilliance and power. So when the great aviation meet approached, and every man, woman, and child in Southern California was eager for details concerning it, and demanded pages of description of the various participating airplanes and aviators, in advance of their exhibition, and when Tom Dunbar, the Tribune's expert on aviation, was suddenly stricken with pneumonia, Chesty Todd was assigned to this important department. 
"'Dig for every scrap of information that can possibly be unearthed,' said the editor to him. "'Spread it out as much as you can, for the dear public wants a cyclone of aerial gossip and will devour every word of it. When there isn't any broth, don't fear to manufacture some. Any mistake in the preliminaries will be forgotten as soon as the big meat is in full swing.' Chesty nodded, stumbled against a chair on his way out, stepped on the toe of the private stenographer, and slammed the door to muffle her scream. Then he made his way to Dominguez Field, strolled among the hangars with his hands in his pockets, and imbibed unimportant information by the column. Two things, however, really interested the reporter. One was the popular interest in the Kane aircraft, which was now in its hangar and invited inspection. Wilson and Brewster, the latter now openly in the employ of Mr. Cumberford, guarded the local aeroplane and explained its unique features to an eager throng, for, although the Kane hangar was in a retired location, around the corner, in fact, a bigger crowd besieged it, on this last day preceding the official opening of the meet, than visited the older and better known devices. Stephen Kane's remarkable flight at Kane Park, which was followed by his peculiar accident, was of course responsible for much of the interest manifested in his machine, and this interest was shared by the experienced aviators present, who silently examined the novel improvements of the young inventor and forbore to discuss them or their alleged merits. "'What do you think of it?' Chesty Todd asked an aviator of national prominence. "'Looks good,' was the evasive reply. "'Cumberford, who was managing the Kane campaign, has been trying hard to get a man to fly it, but so far without success. Pity the thing can't be exhibited. Young Kane, who was entered as the aviator, broke his leg and is now out of it.' The reporter made a mental note of this. He would find out the plans of the Kane party and make a two-column story of their hope or despair. Later in the afternoon, another thing puzzled him. Burthon, the direct competitor of Kane, suddenly and without explanation withdrew his airplane from the meet and actually took it from the field, closing his hangar. The officials and others interested were amazed, and the action aroused considerable comment. Chesty Todd scented a story. He secured an automobile and followed Burthon and Tot Tyler at a distance, until they placed the airplane in the old workshop at South Pasadena. He crept up to the shed unobserved, and found half a dozen men busily putting the parts together again and preparing the device for use. Why, since it had been withdrawn from the aviation meet? Todd and Burthon walked out and went to a nearby restaurant, where the reporter found them seated in a corner engaging in earnest conversation. Chesty made signs to the waiter that he was deaf and dumb, secured a seat at a table within hearing distance of Burthon and his chauffeur, and overheard enough to give him a clue to their latest conspiracy. Then he went away, regained his automobile, and drove straight to the Alexandria Hotel. Mr. Cumberford had insisted on the Canes taking rooms at the hotel during the meet, and all three were now established there. Mrs. Kane, having decided to go each day to Dominguez, where Stephen and Sybil could tell her of the events as they occurred. In a way, the blind woman could thus be able to participate, and avoid the anxiety and suspense of remaining at the bungalow, while her daughter undertook the hazardous feat of operating Stephen's airplane. The Cumberford automobile was placed at the disposal of mother and son, and the young inventor could watch the flight of his machines, while propped among the cushions, Sybil being at his side to attend him and his mother. The party had just finished dinner and assembled in the Cumberford sitting-room, when Chesty Todd's card was brought in. It was marked Tribune, and Mr. Cumberford decided to go down to the office and see the reporter, as it was not his purpose to snub the press at this critical juncture. However, the young man discouraged him at first sight. His appearance was, as usual, against him. "'Will the Kane aircraft be take part in the contests?' he inquired. "'Certainly.' replied Mr. Cumberford. "'You have secured a man to uh, run the thing?' "'We have secured an operator.' Chesty stared at him, his comprehensive mind alert. Why did Cumberford turn his reply to evade the man proposition? Could a woman operate an airplane? Perhaps none but an inexperienced youth would have dreamed of the possibility. "'Has Stephen Kane any family?' he cautiously asked. "'A mother and a sister.' He is unmarried. How old is the sister? Seventeen. Oh, the age seemed to eliminate her. And the mother? It was Cumberford's turn to stare. The mother is blind, he said. 
Mr. Radley Todd's thoughts took another turn. "'Have you a family, sir?' "'I have a daughter, an only child. Mrs. Cumberford is not living.' "'And your daughter's age, sir?' Seventeen. She is the same age as Arissa Kane. "'Are the young ladies, sir, interested in airships?' Mr. Cumberford did not like these questions. He knew that a reporter is akin to a detective, and began to fear the youth was on the track of their secret. So he answered rather stiffly, "'Fairly so. Everyone seems interested in aviation these days. It interests me.' Jesty saw he would not confess. So he tried another tack. "'Mr. Burthon is your brother-in-law, I believe.' Mr. Cumberford nodded. "'You are, uh, enemies?' "'Mr. Radley Todd, or whatever your name is,' angrily glancing at the card. "'I do not object to being interviewed on the subject of the Kane aircraft, or the coming aviation meet, but your questions are becoming personal and are wide of the mark. You will please confine yourself to legitimate topics.' The young man rose and bowed. "'Excuse me,' he said in his halting way. "'A reporter is often forced to appear impertinent when he does not intend to be so. At present I am, or face to face with a curious, uh, complication. I have discovered, uh, unintentionally, that your, uh, aviator will be in great danger tomorrow. If it is a man, I don't care. I don't like you, Mr. Cumberford, and I wouldn't lift a finger to save the Kane aircraft from going to pot. Why should I, eh? It's nothing to me. But if one of the girls, your daughter or Kane's sister, is to fly the thing, I feel it's my duty to say, look out. He started to go, but Cumberford grabbed his arm. "'What do you mean?' he demanded sternly. "'Is it a girl? You won't betray us? You won't publish it?' "'Not at present. Orissa Kane will operate the aircraft.' Chesty looked at his boots reflectively. "'Don't let her undertake it, sir. If you can't find a man, follow Burthon's example and withdraw your airship from the meet.' Better withdraw it, anyhow. That's the best move, if you don't wish to court disaster. Explain yourself, sir. I won't. I'm not going to spoil a good story for my paper, and a scoop in the bargain to satisfy your curiosity. But Miss Kane, may I see her a moment? Mr. Cumberford reflected. If you warn her of danger, you will take away her nerve. She is the only person on earth competent to operate the Kane aircraft, and to withdraw the airplane would mean the ruin of her brother's fortune and ambitions. I don't know her brother. I don't care a fig for him. If I see the girl, I shall warn her, said the reporter. Then you shall not see her. Very good, but will you tell her to look out? What for? For danger. When? At all times, especially during her flight. There is always danger of accident, of course. This won't be an accident, if it happens, said Chesty Todd decidedly. But who would wish to injure Orissa? asked Cumberford wonderingly. Think it over, said the reporter. If you've only one deadly enemy, a person who will stick at nothing being desperate, that's the man. With this he coolly walked away, leaving Mr. Cumberford considerably disturbed but he thought it over and decided to say nothing to Orissa. The warning might refer to Burthon, who was the only person they might expect trouble from, although to Cumberford's astonishment Burthon had quit the field at the last moment and abandoned the contest. Knowing nothing of Sybil's interview with her uncle, the action seemed to indicate, to Cumberford's mind, that Burthon had weakened. Under no circumstances would he have permitted Orissa to face an unknown danger, but it occurred to him, after thinking over the interview, that Mr. H. Chesterton Radley Todd was a fair example of a fool. End of chapter 21